Okay, well, first and most importantly, thank you for the opportunity to continue to serve uh, as executive. It's a great privilege, and thank you for the support that the board has provided uh, through the years and this year as, as we've taken on some, some very significant issues and tried to propel the, the academy forward. Um, tradition is to give a, a report from the national office. This is really, you know, more than the national office. We have a fantastic, talented, and dedicated team in the national offices, but this is also all about partnering with, with you all, our, our member volunteers, and those that are really driving these forward. So as we've been faced with the challenges that, that we've been talking about the, through this entire meeting, we found ourselves going back to our uh, mission statement and vision statement to really give us guidance um, through the times. And, and just to remind everybody, again, really what the CAM is here to do in terms of serving our members, advancing the specialty, promoting excellence, and advocating on, on critical issues for the, for the public, your patients, and the specialty. And a few years ago, we, we really honed and, uh, our vision statement, and that vision statement is, is very critical, you'll see, through the dialogues and the presentations I hope you've seen at the meeting this year and through the activities of the Academy, and that is our real commitment to transform the focus of healthcare to value function. And that is something that's really front and center as we go forward and try to figure our way forward, uh, um, our, our, how we navigate the issues, how we help our members move through the changes that are all around them. So we have traditional approaches. I'll, I'll go through those in terms of advocacy, our quality and research activities, and our education and member service activities. But also, as, as Dr. Bell mentioned, you know, we've had a real keen focus on our member value proposition because we know that we need to not only do all these activities and, and needs of the specialty as a whole, but we need the, the support and the unification of the membership as a whole for physiatry to stay together and for, for the academy to be that voice of the future of physiatry. So we've been keenly focused on the member value proposition. Um, and you'll see more of that rolling out, but essentially it is our commitment to help our members through the transitions that are coming in healthcare help our members have those clinical skills that are going to give them opportunities and career advancements for the future of healthcare, to continue to protect and, and position the specialty for success, and also to provide our members with the resources they're going to need for the mandates that are coming down, if those are uh, government mandates, quality reporting mandates, licensure certification mandates. So these are really our focuses, and there are more and more we're, we're making or keenly aware that we need these to be interwoven within the activities that we do. So I'm going to give a, a brief overview of the activities, although these are high level, and I welcome any discussion uh, after we conclude. We can talk offline because this is truly a, a 30,000 foot of, of what the academy has been up to to give you some. Uh, um, key areas. Our advocacy efforts are always a, uh, uh, a big theme for us. As you know, over the last couple of years, we've expanded dramatically with staff in D.C. and resources dedicated to advocacy. The beginning of the year was a, a great deal of focus, working with organized medicine to repeal SGR, and uh, we were pleasantly surprised when that did move forward um, after 17 years of, of a lot of time, resources, and frustration. Now, as you've heard throughout this whole meeting, SGR has been replaced, and the focus now is on the macro legislation. And from an advocacy standpoint, a great deal of our focus right now is helping, again, working with organized medicine, but within that, you know, specifically representing the voice of physiatry, representing our, our vision statement for, for getting a focus on function in the macro regulations that are coming out. And right now, a lot of our time is, in, is representing you at CMS listening sessions, at the AMA task forces that are working on what truly will define the definition of alternative payment models. So between now and, and the course of the beginning of 2016, a lot of advocacy time will be spent on defining the, the final rules, the regulations that are around the legislation around MACRA. Also, uh, our, our efforts from the ACA Act continue. Uh, years ago, we talked about how the CAMI was successful in getting rehabilitation and, and habilitation services um, included in the ACA Act language. Our commitment is still there, and we're working with the Habilitation Benefits Coalition to make sure that we continue those efforts working at the state level to make sure that those definitions and requirements continue to be revol uh, evolved and, and mandated so we have those services available in the essential health benefit packages at the state levels. 
Also, some of our other advocacy efforts, we've helped uh, um, lead the uh, support the introduction of the Sports Medicine Licensure Clarity Act, which allows sports medicine team physicians to travel across state lines. We continue to work on scope of practice issues and, and protecting the role of the physician and, and, and the, um, uh, the key role of diagnostics. We've uh, had spent a lot of time testifying on the visits on the Hill, testifying at CMS on a number of um, LCDs and other, specifically the one here in the lower limb prosthetics, other threatening issues that are coming down in LCDs and activities that uh, the Academy's voice and physiatry's voice needs to be heard. Our target, uh, as we look at what's going on legislatively, we also know that post-acute care is going under tremendous change, and we know that the MACRA Act, although the repeal of SGR was done in a way that didn't require a full pay for, which was a pleasant surprise, um, post-acute care continues to be a target for various pay fors, including some of the activities of MACRA. So we continue to, to try to protect and move and, and the, the interest of our, our members and the, and the facilities that they work in in terms of protecting the pay fors. But we also know that post-acute care is going through lots of changes. There's legislation that's in the Medicare Post-Acute Care Value uh, Purchasing Act that is, has been introduced. There's different, different bundling innovations that you've heard through uh, this morning's presentation. Uh, Bob McCa Rob Mechanic presents some of those in other sessions. There's concerns that we have over the impact on graduate medical education with the changes that are um, underway in, in post-acute care. And through these efforts, not only are we advocating, but we worked early in the year to, to try to pull together many of the stakeholders uh, across the continuum of post-acute care to begin dialogues and how we can work together on some of these key issues and more work needs to continue there. Our focus on advocacy also has uh, continued with our commitment to research capacity. Um, the Academy was one of the founding members and is one of the leaders of the current uh, DRC, Disability Rehabilitation and Research Coalition. We've made great gains this year in our efforts to make ch uh, get changes put in place at, inside the NIH, um, really to raise the visibility and stature of the NCMRR and the focus on disability research. We've done that through uh, both uh, the relationship building with those at the NIH, but we're also continuing to pursue that legislatively so we can put in place uh, the specifics, and, and as we were concerned about turnover, actually there's turnover going on right now at the NIH, so although things are moving forward through relationships and handshakes, we continue to want to have the um, legislation in place so there's no backsliding on the focus for rehabilitation research. Advocacy also continues in the reimbursement realm, and, and a lot of uh, what I mentioned before, a lot of our focus is we've really expanded resources and dedication, both in staff time and our, and our volunteer members' time, to uh, responding to the unfavorable insurance coverage determinations that are out there. These are coming fast and furious, and we're working um, in expanding committees, expanding staff expertise and focus so that we can really make sure the physiatric voice is, is uh, uh, loud and clear in responding to some of these onerous uh, um, uh, and detrimental um, LCDs that, are, that have been rolling forward. We continue to respond to the Medicare uh, fee schedule uh, calls and all the other proposed rule comments that are out there. And although our efforts continue with the RUC and CPT, we've expanded not, we've, we've expanded our commitment and our role at RUC and CPT. We've been working our way over the last couple of years to be, to have seats and to have very important leadership roles on several of the committees. So it's not only dealing with the one-off issues that come through the RUC and CPT activities, but it's getting physiatry placed in the right seats so the voice is there from the beginning. For instance, you'll see the CPT editorial panels, the one that's uh, on physical medicine rehabilitation that's really going to be charged with developing the new codes, code sets, and some things are very critical to the future of reimbursement. There are some issues that we, that uh, outside of those realms and the public health issues that we understand the critical nature of the public health crisis around opioids and uh, we're as committed, we are committed as an academy on several fronts, both to help resolve this in some of our work with the AMA uh, convened task force, the work with um, uh, the other activities that are going on many fronts that uh, deal with pain and opioids. But we're also committed to making sure that it is a, if it is a necessary part of your toolkit, that we protect your ability to have this in the toolkit. And there's been many efforts at the state level and otherwise that were threatening to physiatrists having um, uh, opioid management in your toolkit. So it's something that we need to balance the public health 
side of this as well as, as, as your interest in serving your patients. On the quality and research front, I'll say more about uh, what we're doing there. Um, but there's, there's two sides of this, which is also providing the, the resources that our members want, but there's also an advocacy side of this. On the quality and research uh, resource side, we've been working over several years and, and a lot this year to make sure our members have the tools they need to satisfy what those current requirements are. You've heard lots of discussions of how PQRS and meaningful use and all those are evolving into the new MIPS. But our resources that we've developed in terms of putting together the, the guide to what measures are out there, a resource to our members so they can identify what, what uh, measurement sets and what outcome measure would be most appropriate for physiatry, putting together the quality toolboxes for different kind of subspecialty components of, the, of, of PMNR, putting out attestation guidelines for meaningful use one and two, and providing the PQRS wizard as a, as a resource and tool for members reporting to CMS. On the representation side, it's important that we continue, and we have had a strong voice this year at PCPI and at other um, uh, convened venues where physiatric voice needs to be there as quality measures are advancing. Uh, we've had uh, the ability to get three appointments to CMS committees that are developing post-acute care measures, and, and our volunteer members are serving there, uh, advocating for the issues that are important to you. Uh, Dr. Flanagan, we're, we're able to get a, a co-leadership of the AAN Stroke Rehabilitation Measurement Work Group. And we continue to work on the front of the IMPACT Act, which we supported, which is about uh, creating standardized outcome quality measures across the different settings in post-acute care. You've seen a lot at this meeting about practice resources and about practice management and, and our uh, uh, kind of how we look at that as providing resources and education for our members in terms of managing your practice, in terms of transitioning your practices with the changes coming in healthcare, and also with uh, opportunities to diversify your practice because some of those changes. So we've been uh, providing, uh, developing a number of resources to help our members through this. On the coding front, we revitalized the, the coding companion and developed an ICD-10 crosswalk, which we've gotten uh, wonderful uh, positive feedback on the value of that from members. We also put out a, an ongoing series of free webinars on many critical issues this year, coding updates, and we had fast and furious coding uh, webinars. We had uh, kind of an introduction and win-win approaches to ACO educational webinar. We did a, an educational webinar on the NIH NIAMS Institute. Um, and other PQRS reporting, and these will continue in the future. So looking ahead at 2016 and beyond, uh, Dr. Bell shared already with you our big commitments, and you've heard it throughout this meeting. We need to provide our members with the resources to be successful, to transition and to meet the requirements that are there. We're committed to building those APM models, alternative payment models, to, to developing the resources and the solutions for our members to be successful with MIPS, um, to build the registries that our, that our members are going to need to be successful in reporting and, and improving in the future. We, we are committed to being at the table as the macro final rules and dialogues are continued to develop um, that are there. We're, we're committed to working uh, with post-acute care for the evolution and development, helping our members prepare to work across the continuum in post-acute care where the opportunities lie. We also will continue our webinar series looking at changes in coding in 2016, and also saw a commitment to do a webinar on uh, operating a cash practice, as well as many others that will roll out through the year. Um, we'll continue the regional coding workshops that we've expanded in 2015, and we'll continue, and continue to be there to represent the specialty in the different fee schedule and LCD uh, dialogues that we need to be in. On the education and member services front, we, uh, last year we announced the uh, technology upgrades and the merger of Knowledge Now, the forum, the FIS forum, and the Me site into one platform. And through this year, we've been working to improve that integration, but also not just from a usability standpoint, but um, from a behind the scenes standpoint. So these can continue to merge into um, new exciting opportunities where there'll be education and knowledge resources and collaborative efforts between our members all on one platform. In the Academy catalog, some exciting new developments for this year were a, a number of new SAEP products on concussion, mild TBI, regenerative medicine. There was a lot of work from the Medical Education Committee in creating the uh, Mach 3 online exam, the certification exam, uh, Prep Q Bank, and a number of other resources that have been developed through the years, uh, through the year for our members on the Me catalog. 
Our commitment remains to helping our members meet the requirements of uh, MOC and providing uh, options and resources for Parts uh, 2, preparation for Part 3, and solutions to Part 4. This meeting, uh, 2015 Assembly, has been a great success. Um, it's a lot of work from the Program Planning Committee. I don't know if everybody knows, and there was a short video that we put together quickly in terms of the creation of the meeting. But, but as you've all been sitting here in this meeting, uh, the Program Planning Committee has had several meetings um, um, fin almost finalizing the 2016 meeting. I would say about 75% about of the meeting is already kind of being developed as we're, as we're speaking now. So this happens, this is an all year, year and a half process, but the 2015 meeting, just a few stats that you see here in terms of the number of sessions. We had 850 abstracts and case reports submitted. That continues to grow every year. I think 400, 450 of those were accepted. Um, and, a, and a much greater focus on blending both the clinical education and the practice and, and business uh, education. Uh, three pre-conference courses on ultrasound coding and billing and regenerative, and we continue the streaming activities of the regenerative medicine course. And we'll be looking for expanding our online streaming act activities of, in the future of different parts of the annual assembly. Um, a couple years ago, the board um, made a commitment to expand not just the clinical education and, and the practice education, but the experience of the annual assembly. And, and hopefully you've seen those through the last few years as, as we've worked to expand opportunities for interaction between uh, attendees, um, uh, new innovation opportunities in the exhibit hall and other ways to uh, interface, as well as some of the social events. So uh, last night there were 750 people that enjoyed the JFK library, uh, the wonder, wonderful event. Uh, we already have plans for next year in New Orleans to, to continue that. You'll see the different Meet the Experts, the movement competition, uh, residents' hands-on experience for a private uh, hands-on experience in the exhibit hall, and a special showcase on EHR. Our attendance, uh, they're still tallying it up right now. Dr. Welsh, I can't answer your question specifically, um, but we had over 2,500 attendees that included over 550 residents. You know, overall, we had about 3,300, 3,400 people here. So uh, slightly less than gangbusters last year in San Diego, which was actually a 10 to 15% jump over our historical high, but this is greater than all the years before that. So our, north, our northerly trend continues in terms of the success of the annual assembly. Outside of the annual assembly, the in-person education, uh, we uh, had in June the diagnostic uh, and interventional ultra, uh, musculoskeletal ultrasound course. Uh, Evan Peck was the course director. Um, these ultrasound courses, we continue to get feedback out of all the ultrasound courses that are offered out there, the ones offered by the academy, the ones developed by our members with the physiatric focus are the best that exist in the marketplace. And uh, um, this was another excellent course in June. We've developed a number of partnerships to also expand our, our educational offerings. We work with the Spine Intervention Society um, for a collaborative on access to lumbar uh, uh, injection courses and also a collaboration with the Mayo Clinic on the uh, sports medicine review course. Our career services is something that we've also focused on and, and are expanding and will continue to expand because of some of the transitions that are in your environment and, and in the uh, workplace. Um, the job board has continued and has grown, and the job fair on Wednesday night had, uh, I think it ended up being about 110 employers and then a very packed crowd, over 700 attendees. And these are not just now, as, as many of you that participate in there, the residents and others coming in, but mid-career folks looking at some of the activities and changes in their careers. So looking ahead in education and member services, we're going to be focused on spasticity online educational offerings in 2016. We're going to continue to expand the coding and billing regional workshops. Um, more emphasis on practice preparedness and early career resources for transitioning your practice and those entering the field. We're going to have SAP procs on pain management and sports medicine as part of the PM&R journal supplements. And we'll continue to expand new topics and updating of knowledge now. Um, 2016 will be the first year for one of our new innovations, which will be putting the self-assessment ex exam online, the SAER for residents, as an online tool. This will be a benefit to both the residents and the programs for very quick feedback um, um, on the SAER exam. We will be announcing soon in the next couple of months the, a new standalone course on 
uh, and transitioning and diversifying your practice. So this will be a standalone course, really digging deeper on some of the themes that you've heard through this meeting and taking those down further in terms of options for well, your private practice, your academic practice, or other transitions that you may be looking on, looking for. And the sports medicine collaboration with Mayo will continue in mid-June in Minneapolis. The annual assembly has already announced us in New Orleans next year. Um, we're looking forward to returning to New Orleans and uh, we'll have a wide array of offerings and pre-courses and continue kind of the expansion of the social um, experience opportunities that we've been rolling out for the last couple of years. Our medical student program, uh, and just in terms of reaching out and engaging uh, future physiatrists, engaging our volunteers, our medical student uh, program is going on right now. We had uh, about 120, 130 medical students registered for today, plus another 80 that were registered for the entire meeting. So we have over 200 medical students. This program continues to, um, to grow as we introduce the specialty to the, the best and brightest coming into the field. Um, you'll see that the residency fair was also something that we started that will be this afternoon, and that's sold out with 30 residencies participating in that program. So overall, the, the, as mentioned, the volunteers are really what, um, not only what keep the academy moving forward and, and produce everything that I'm talking about here, but the enjoyable part for myself and for my team back in, in Rosemont in terms of working with all of you, uh, we have five, uh, roughly 520 volunteers that participated in the academy this year, and, and that's what really makes this all happen. So thank you, and um, Madam President, that's my report for this year. Okay. Thank you.